Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening service here at Great Vic. If this is your church home where you're just visiting with us this evening, I trust you'll feel warmly welcomed and encouraged as we praise the Lord together. Our bulletin has all of our announcements in it, uh, especially this very little, uh, very helpful little calendar section. You can track with everything that's happening there. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we'll be meeting at 7.45 for our midweek uh, prayer time uh, and Bible study. And then we'll be back next Sunday, God willing, for our morning and evening services. And in the evening next Sunday, we plan uh, to baptize Kyle Boyce. Um, these services are always a wonderful opportunity to invite friends and family along uh, to see a Christian baptism and to explain the gospel uh, and what it is that Christ has done for us. So do feel free to invite friends, family, anyone you know uh, to come along to that so that they can have the opportunity to hear the gospel and see it displayed in the ordinance of baptism. Now we're here this evening to worship the living God and I was thinking uh, back on uh, a few years ago when Lindsay and I lived in Madagascar, there was a time when uh, it was very hot and I was absolutely roasted and we were out for a walk and we came upon this lovely waterfall and a big plunge pool and uh, I jumped in and I uh, put my head under the waterfall and it was just so refreshing. Uh, it felt like it had just given me new life. And in John's Gospel, chapter 7, Jesus speaks these words on the last day of one of the great Jewish festivals. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And of this, he was speaking of the Spirit. So streams of living water coming from the Lord. In Christ, we are refreshed together. And that's why we gather this evening, to be refreshed in the presence of the Lord. So let's stand together and we'll sing our first two hymns that speak of the hope we have in Christ, the word of God the Father.
Let's continue our worship and prayer. Let's pray together. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, one God, we come to you this evening as thirsty people. You know all the deep appetites in our souls, our longing to know love, our longing for security, our longing for a sense that we belong, a longing for a purpose, for meaning. There are deep longings in our souls that are like appetites, like thirst. And though we go to many places to try and find that appetite satisfied and to find that thirst quenched, we know that those deepest level appetites and that thirst of the soul can only ever be satisfied and quenched in you, our God. Lord Jesus, you invite us to come to you in our dryness, in our weariness, with those gaping longings. And you've said that you can quench our thirst. More than that, you can actually fill us with your spirit, giving us regeneration, new creation life, and causing your Holy Spirit to work within us, making streams of living water flow within us so that we find the very source of satisfaction that there is in you, our God, flowing within us. Lord Jesus, you put it another way when you said, if you abide in me, you'll bear fruit. Apart from me, you're like branches that are broken off a tree. You dry up and wither. But united to Christ in the tree, in the vine, we find all the life and the blessings of the goodness of you, our God. We find those coursing through our veins. And so we come this evening to you, our God, hungry and thirsty and we look to you, the one who can give us refreshment. Refreshing streams from the presence of the Lord. We come to stand under the fountain of your grace this evening. Grace and love like mighty rivers that pour incessant from above. We just stand under them this evening and ask that you would refresh us and make us feel alive again. For there is so much that wearies us, Father. There's so much that goes on in our lives that can weigh us down and that can cause our, our souls to kind of wilt. And so we just come and confess, Lord, our weaknesses. We confess our sins and our struggles. We're sorry, Lord, for all the ways we wander. We're prone to, to wander and we feel it, Lord prone to leave the God we love. But Lord, come this evening and just bind our wandering hearts to thee again. Refresh us with your life-giving presence. Fill us with your spirit to overflowing. And may we together rejoice because this evening we've met with you. Lord, I pray particularly for anyone here this evening and they feel like a, a, a little sheep that's lost their way, who's strayed away and got into trouble. Oh Lord, you're the God who goes after the one. And may you bring the one in this evening, we pray, and encourage us together with good nourishment and good pasture in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, please open to Acts chapter 3, and Scott Cinnamon's going to come and read, us, read that for us. Thanks, Scott. Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 26. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? 
Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or, pi or piety we have made them walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the offer of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Thanks for reading that for us, Scott. We're going to stand together again and sing two songs that speak to us of the assurance that we have through Jesus Christ.
please do be seated. And just before Simon comes to preach to us, Aubrey Smith's going to come and lead us in our prayers for the world and for the church. Thanks, Aubrey. Let's pray. Father God, King of the nations, God, we bow our hearts to you alone tonight. We confess that you alone are worthy of all worship, that you alone are exalted above all creation, that you reign over all on your throne. Jesus, we lift our eyes to you, our slain and victorious Savior. We thank you that we have full access to you, that you have welcomed us into your family at the cost of your own life. King Jesus, we give our lives over to you. God, would you align our hearts to do your will, to do your will? Would you allow us to walk in step with your spirit for your glory? God, you promised blessing to the nations through the seed that was to come, Jesus the Messiah. God, the nations are raging. All creation is groaning and crying out for justice, for renewal. Jesus, we long for your return when you will make all things new. God, until that day, Lord, we ask that you would empower us as your people whom you've called as your royal priesthood through Christ to minister your blessing to a broken world. Lord Jesus, in your name we bless the people of Ukraine. We praise you for the Thanksgiving service that was held here this weekend. Um, and we thank you for the fellowship and the worship in Ukrainian um, within these walls. God, we pray blessing and healing over this nation. We pray for restoration and hope in a situation of despair. God, would you make us a people whose arms are as open in welcome as yours were to us? Would you bind this church together as a true family, a place of belonging and love and hospitality? for all who come through our doors. God, we pray for the refugees and asylum seekers in, in our church tonight. Um, God, those who have been coming to church, um, those who are not far outside these walls. God, we pray that you would bless them with the hope of the gospel, with healing from their traumas, with life where they have seen so much death. God, we pray, pray blessing and peace over Northern Ireland in these politically tumultuous days. We pray for repentance and humility, for people of influence and power to bow their knee to you and to look to the interests of others and not themselves. God, would you empower your people to remain as faithful witnesses no matter what happens or who is in power. Lord, bless us with the steady assurance that comes from our citizenship in your unshakable kingdom. Lord, I pray for those in our congregation who are battling loneliness, depression, anxiety, or despair. God, would you bless them with peace and with the shelter of your presence. Would you strengthen them to take every thought captive, to recognize the lies and the accusations that come from the enemy who wants to steal and kill and destroy? Oh God, would you bless us with your life, your abundant life and your hope that you've promised us. God, we lift up our eyes to you for our help. God, we lift up those in our congregation who, because of their health, can't be with us in person. Um, God, would you encourage these precious and valuable members of our family? Would you fill them with new power in their prayer? 
and in their daily lives, to live faithfully right where they are. Father, we give you praise for your lavish generosity towards us. You've given us every blessing in Christ. Would you help us know more deeply the riches of your grace, to understand the vast measure of the love that you have towards us? And would you help us make that grace and love known to all that we meet? We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much, Aubrey, for praying for us. Do open up your, uh, your Bibles, if you've got them with you, back to Acts uh, chapter 3 that Scott read for us earlier. Well, um, Aubrey's just been praying uh, along these lines. Um, we as humans, I think, long to receive blessing, don't we? Blessing of all kinds. Blessings for our families or on our families. Blessings related to good food. Blessing of a warm home on increasingly cold autumn nights. Or blessings perhaps of a successful or fulfilling job. Or blessings of continued good health. In fact, it seems like it's increasingly a thing now on social media to speak of our blessings, right? I'm just so blessed. Hashtag blessed, blessed, hashtag luckiest man or woman alive. Now, uh, whether that's always the case or not, or that's someone just fronting up, uh, putting up some good things, I'll leave you to make those kind of judgments. But I think it's getting at the root desire that is out there for all of us to receive blessings to be blessed. And given that, in tonight's passage, we're going to see something pretty mind-blowing. We're going to see what it is to be blessed by God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Often, if we're Christians, we're quick to forget our blessings, aren't we? And so tonight's going to be a reminder for us of just how much we have received from our God. But this passage also speaks loud and clear for those of you out there who perhaps wouldn't call yourselves Christians, because this passage is going to spell out the blessings that you too can enjoy in Jesus, blessings that meet your greatest need, blessings that turn despair to delight. Speaking of which, if you were with us last Sunday evening, you'll remember something of turning despair to delight, won't you? Do you remember what we saw in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10? We saw the transforming work of the name of Jesus in this lame man's life. A man who went from despair to delight, from drudgery to dancing, as in the name of Jesus, Peter completely heals him gives him a new life to live, a life where he now could go wherever he wanted, do whatever he wanted. Given that, how could we maybe describe the lame man today? Blessed. Blessed. It would be pretty apt, wouldn't it, if surely this man, he's allowed to go on social media now and talk about his blessings, right? That would be fair. He's blessed. But notice with me that it isn't just this man himself who is amazed at the blessing that he's received. If you've got a Bible there, look at verse 11, where we're picking up this evening. Look at how we pick up. We read that, well, he clung to Peter and John. Seemingly, this man was cured, but, but probably not so surprisingly, after 40 years of not being able to walk, he's maybe sort of slightly unsure, keeps going back, whatever. But he's fully healed, but you can see this. Well, well, he's clinging to them. All the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. The blessing, the life transformation that this man has received has made everyone stop and take notice. 
And of course, not only are the people taking notice of this man, but we see that they're also taking notice of something else, the source of this blessing. Look at verse 12, and we'll see this. It says, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. Do you see how Peter's putting it there? Presumably here, standing with John, he says, why do you stare at us? The people, seeing what's happened to this lame man, presume, don't they, that it's Peter and John who's done this amazing thing. But Peter wastes no time, does he, in putting them right. He says to them, it isn't, listen, it isn't us who blessed this man, who's brought about this transformation. It's Jesus. It is all about Jesus. He's the one on show here. Look at how he then continues in verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. Peter says, fellow Jews, don't go staring at us. This lame man's healing isn't our work. This is the work of our God. This is the, the work of Jesus. This is the work of the same God who has made himself known to us. This is the work of Jesus who has, glor who has been glorified. Peter says to those running over, Listen, this is all about Jesus. This is his work. And Peter, I think, is immediately saying this to the crowd for two reasons. First, pure and simple, because that's the truth. And he wants to make it crystal clear. He wants to give credit where credit is due. This wasn't Peter's work. This was Jesus' work. But I think he's also saying this for a second reason. Because as he, see the, as he sees these people coming to him, he recognizes and realizes that these same people need this same Savior, this same blessing. He says, listen, this is all about Jesus, and do you know what? Now what I'm going to tell you is that this very same Jesus who has blessed this lame man, he also came to bless you too. Look at how Peter goes on, if you skip over a few verses there with me, to verse 16, to speak of how it was Jesus' name and by faith in it that the lame man was healed. He says, and his name, that is, Jesus' name, by faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. But that isn't where he stops, is it? Because as he continues on in verse 17 and beyond, Peter then proclaims that as one commentator puts it, his audience needed Jesus just as much as the lame man did. Not for physical healing, but for spiritual healing. This same audience needs Jesus. See, as we were thinking about last week, Jesus' uh, pa power, he doesn't just have power, does he, to strengthen a lame man's feet and ankles. He has power to do so much more than that. Just as by faith this man was healed, blessed by Jesus, so by faith Peter is going to declare to us this evening, you also can be blessed by Jesus. Receiving blessings that are even greater than the, this lame man received. Look with me here to the end of Peter's sermon, and I think we're going to see this. Verses 25 and 26. Peter makes it clear that those who he is speaking to, the Jews, he makes it clear that this same Jesus who transformed this man's life is the one that they've all been waiting for, the one who has come to bring them blessing. Verses 25 and 26. Peter says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, having sent Jesus, that is, sent him to you first. Why? To bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Peter here is referring to God's promise all those years back to Abraham. 
that in Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And he's saying, listen, this has now happened. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham has come. And he's bringing blessing. He's bringing this promised blessing. And look at the ending there. Verse 16, Peter says, God sent Jesus to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. God has sent this Jesus to bless you. And as we said at the start, we have to understand that this is no small thing that we're talking about here. This is not some kind of small blessing of a compliment or someone helping you out with a little handy job around your house or giving you some money that you forgot for your lunch. No, this is the greatest blessing because this is God's blessing. This is the God of the universe and the God who made you. The God who knows you inside out, knows you better even than you know yourself. He knows your deepest desires. He knows your deepest needs, your longings, your fears. And he has come to bless you. See, so many people in the world around, we're chasing after all sorts of things, satisfaction, joy, hope, purpose in our lives. And we're seeking them in created things. But actually, the truth is that the creator of all things, he is the greatest source of blessing. And so we need to come back to him. This is what Peter's saying, because only in God, through Christ, can we really have all of our desires satisfied, all of our fears calmed. Now, as we see this, we also need to recognize the good news for us here in these words that Peter's saying too, because he's clearly specifically speaking, isn't he, with those who are in front of him. He's saying Jesus has sent, been sent to these people, these Jews specifically here, who are in front of him first. But the promise is not in any way limited to those back then. I want to see, uh, see this as we look at the scope of this blessing. Look again in verse 25. Peter's quoting from Genesis chapter 22, and he says that in Jesus all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is why this passage tonight holds out such good news for us. Because just as Peter is saying to those who were listening to him back then, he is also saying to us, Jesus came to bless you today. Jesus' blessing did come to the Jews first. But as the book of Acts is going to go on to show, as we work our way through it over the next months, This blessing will know no boundaries. Incredibly, it is a blessing that reaches us today, 2,000 years later in the city center of Belfast. Isn't that amazing? A blessing for all the families of the earth. So here's the good news as we sit here. This is good news. We can receive blessing from our God. And it's a blessing that we're all looking for, longing for. It's a blessing that's going to put a spring in our step, just like that lame man had, and it's going to give us strength to endure, to persevere, even amongst the hardships of life. So as we see all of that kind of in the context of what we're seeing here today, this blessing, this blessing that's being held out to you today, I want us now to see this wider context of this blessing. And here we're going to see, as we look through the rest of the passage, four things related to our blessing. First off, we're going to see our desperate situation. A desperate situation into which we need God's blessing in Jesus. We're going to see here that we're all sinners who condemn Jesus to death. As Scott was reading for us earlier, did you notice how Peter went for the jugular with those who he was listening to? There was no beating around the bush, was it? It was a bit uncomfortable almost, wasn't it? Let's look at me with the second half of verse 13. Having spoken about God glorifying his servant Jesus, he then says to the crowd, and it was this Jesus who you delivered and you denied in the presence of Pilate. In verse 14, he goes on, he says, you denied the holy and righteous one. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. Pretty harsh words, strong words 
So why is he saying it? Remember, he, he already has uh, spoken like this, if you were with us a, a while back as we were looking at the sermon at Pentecost. But this seems even more direct. And I think the reason he's saying this is simple. He is explaining to the crowd here that if they thought this lame man had been in a desperate situation that he's been pulled out of, well, they are in a worse situation than him. This Jesus who has blessed and transformed the life of this lame man is the same one that you put to death. So where does that leave them? Well, it leaves them as guilty. They've killed, as Peter puts it there, the holy and righteous one, the author of life. He had come to bring them life, but they've put him to death. Again, as we see this language here, I think we have to see the wider point. Yes, it was likely that some of those here were actually present in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' death. They were calling for Jesus to be killed before Pilate. But it was likely, I guess, in a crowd like this, that some of them weren't there too. So what are they to make of this kind of accusation? Well, I think the same that we're meant to make of this accusation today None of us, of course, 2,000 years later, we weren't physically there, were we, at Jesus' death? But this is where Peter's words sting for us today too. Because actually, in one way or another, all of us here this evening were responsible for Jesus' death. Here's what one commentator says, and listen carefully to how he shows us that as we read this passage, we need not just to see the desperate, desperate situation of those back then, but we need to see the desperate situation of us today too. Here's what he says, reflecting on this passage. He says, we need to realize that we are all to blame for the death of Christ in one way or another. Even though we weren't there at the time, Jesus was arrested, tried, crucified. It was our sins that took him there. And if Jesus were here today, we would spurn him today too just as the masses of Israel spurned him in Jerusalem long ago. This is the sorry reality for all of us. God made us to live for him, to serve him, but each and every one of us has time and time again gone our own way, rejected our God's good rule, and looked to live just however we want. These are strong words, aren't they? If Jesus were here today, we would spurn him today too. But these, that's the truth. That is our sinful nature. Apart from the saving work of God in our lives, that is what we are like. We are those who sentenced Jesus to death because we'd rather see him die than be Lord of our lives. So where does that leave us today and those back then in this desperate situation? One in which surely there can be no hope We've cast off the Son of God. Surely now, likewise, we will be cast off from God too. But Peter's stuck the knife in, hasn't he? But that isn't the end. Because he wants to show us now that there is still hope. Here's what Peter says. Given the situation you're in, the desperate situation, in fact, as one who denied Christ himself, given the situation that Peter himself is also in, or found himself in. Here is our only hope. Our only hope is that God would make a way to pull us from this situation. In fact, I don't know if you noticed it, but even as Peter has been condemning those he's speaking to, there have been glimmers of this hope in the text, in the language that he's been using. Look with me, first of all, in verse 13, where Peter says that God glorified his servant, Jesus. And this word servant is the same one that is used in the Greek translation of Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. A text that so many of those listening would have been so familiar with. It's a passage that describes the suffering servant. The one who would come to bear our griefs, to carry our sorrows. The one who would be pierced for our transgressions, our sins the one who would be crushed for our iniquities, the one who would bring us peace, and the one who would heal us 
by his wounds, just like he healed that lame man that we saw last week. Look at what Peter says later then in verse 18. He says, yes, you put Jesus to death, but this was actually fulfilling this prophecy, a prophecy of hope. A prophecy of hope for even the worst of sinners. Look at what he says, verse 18. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ, that is his long-promised Messiah, this servant, would suffer, he thus fulfilled. When we stop and think about this, this is really incredible, isn't it? Peter is saying to those in front of him, don't despair. You're in this seemingly desperate situation, but all is not lost. Do you know that even as you put Jesus to death, God was actually at work. He was at work so that instead of you being condemned by your sin, you could be made free. You could be forgiven. As Peter goes on to say in verses 22 and 26, this has always been God's plan right from the beginning of time. A plan that was made clear time and time again through the Old Testament prophets. God would make a way. He would send someone, another prophet, who would speak and bring hope into an otherwise hopeless world. Someone who would bring blessing even to the worst of sinners. Blessing that would reach to the ends of the earth. So Peter says, here is where you're at. You've run to us. You've seen this lame man healed. But here's your situation. You are those who condemned Christ to death. You are in a worse situation, but God has made a way. Look there at verse 15, particularly the second half, and you can sense the hope here too. Peter says, You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. See, Christ's death wasn't the end, was it? It didn't likewise then therefore spell certain death for everyone else too because the author of life, the Son of God, he could not stay dead. Death couldn't contain the holy and righteous one, the one who had never sinned. And so in his resurrection, there is hope for all of us. Death is not the end. And and this same living and reigning Christ who we've just seen has transformed, has blessed this lame man. Well, he can also do the same for us today then too. He is living and reigning and at work. So how should we respond? Well, here again, Peter helps us, doesn't he? Spelling out really clearly the right response to this situation that we find ourselves in. Look with me at verse 19 and we're going to see this. Here is our right response to all of this. We need to repent and turn back to God. Peter says, verse 19, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. We've already heard this language of repentance in the book of Acts, haven't we? Do you remember back in that sermon in, in Pentecost, Peter called for it, and we're, we're going to hear it again and again and again. Almost every evangelistic sermon, in fact, I think every evangelistic sermon that is in the book of Acts calls for the people to repent. So why does he call for that? Because in God's grace, it is through repentance and turning back to God that we can be made right with him and receive his blessing. God, our God of grace, doesn't say to us, listen, you killed my son, that is it. You're done. No, instead, he, by the Spirit, wants to convict us of just how wrong it is that we would kill his son and give us a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance, a hundredth chance, a thousandth chance. This is the grace of God. He calls us to come back to him in repentance That is, coming in sorrow for how we've treated Jesus and then actively living and seeking to live with him as Lord in our lives. Like, just like we should have been from the beginning. Here's how the American pastor, James Montgomery Boyce, puts it, ramping up this idea of repentance from a simple one-off saying sorry 
to a whole life and attitude change. He says this, repentance is feeling sorry enough to quit. And quitting means turning from sin to Jesus Christ. Look at that. That's the language there of verse 19, isn't it? Repent, therefore, and turn back. This is the turning involved in repentance, isn't it? Saying, I'm sorry, God, I have been going in my own direction. Please, will you help me and forgive me? And now will you help me to go in your direction completely the other way? That is repentance. Whether you're a Christian here this evening or or not, I want us all just to stop and take in the grace, though, that is on offer here. Sometimes we can uh, fall into the trap of thinking that Christianity is some kind of rule, list of rules that we need to follow so that we can feel good about ourselves. Certainly that's what people often around us will say, isn't it? Well, that's just for you to make yourself feel better. But that couldn't be further from the case. This is the heart of Christianity, the grace of our God. The grace of God that has reached for me and has reached for you and has pulled you and me from the raging sea. We were like those people Peter's talking to. Each of us condemned, each of those who condemned God's son to death and who apart from his boundless love would have no hope. We would have continued going in that opposite direction, wouldn't we? Running from the one source of all blessing, of goodness, and we would have been cast off from his presence forever. But this is Christianity. Grace. Grace poured out to us because in God's grace, that does not have to be the end. We do not have to be defined by our own, per- our own attempts at living the perfect life, which we never will. Instead, we can be defined by the Lord Jesus Christ, the holy and righteous one, if we will turn and repent and come back to him. So what happens if we do that then? Repent and turn back. Well, here's where we've been headed right the way through this passage, this central section. Because now in verse 19 and 20 and 21, Peter spells out the blessing. The blessing that all of us now can enjoy if we repent and turn back. In these verses, we hear proclaimed our incredible blessing. In fact, three incredible blessings. Blessing for our past, blessing in the present, and blessing for the future. Look with me there at verse 19 and see this first blessing then. Total forgiveness for our past. Look at that verse with me. Peter says, Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. As we've been saying, this is God's grace, isn't it? Peter has just proclaimed to these people that in their ignorance they put God's son to death. Surely that's going to be the end for them. But no, Peter says, if you repent and turn, all your sin, even that sin of putting Jesus to death, will be blotted out. And look at the language here. He's saying that in turning back there and turning back from their sin and turning back to Christ, the sin will be blotted out. This is no, uh, well, just we'll pass over it for now and we'll come back to it later. Those are the kind of conversations maybe we have in our homes, right? Well, let's talk about it later, what you've just done to me. But no, this is the language of obliterating, washing away, erasing, never to be seen again. Our sin is never going to be counted against us if we're in Christ. We can picture what Peter is talking about perhaps like this. As we come to our God, we carry around our sin, don't we? Our sin, condemning Jesus. But not just that, pride, envy, slander, arrogance, sexual immorality. And this is what we would be presenting to our God on the final day, apart from Christ. But look at this. God says he will forgive us. He will completely erase it so that it is completely gone. And so instead of presenting our sin, we present the blamelessness of Christ. We have hope. 
Our slate is clean if we are in Jesus. We no longer need to fear God's judgment. It will, as we see in this passage, it will fall on those who don't turn to Christ, but it will not fall on anyone who calls on Christ, who repents and comes to him. No more does our sin weigh us down. No more can Satan tempt us to despair. No more do we face eternal condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because they have been blessed. Blessed with the blotting out, the erasing, the wiping away of every single sin. That's the blessing that only God can give us. But not only that then, look at also at the second blessing there in verse 20. The blessing of the present refreshing that Jesus also came to bring. Verse 20. For those who repent and turn back, there will be times of refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord. Now, as we look at this promise here, this blessing, we find a parallel, don't we, back in Acts chapter 2. Peter said that those who repented were to receive, likewise, forgiveness, and secondly, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I think that is clearly what's in view here. Look at the language. There's times of refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. The new covenant blessing is that God now dwells with his people with those today who are trusting in Christ. And the Holy Spirit's presence with us refreshes us, refreshes our soul. First, because he reminds us of this glorious truth that we've just been saying. We are forgiven. We can come to our God whenever because we are not condemned by our God, but welcomed to him. The burden of sin has gone. But then also, we find refreshing in the presence of God because we know that by his Spirit, he goes with us into every single day. Now, the language here is interesting, isn't it? May know times of refreshing. I don't think this here is a promise where you're going to have a completely refreshing, completely stress-free life. That just isn't the case, isn't it, for us as Christians? We do face hardships. We do face times when we feel spiritually dry and completely spent. But we can know that even in those times, we have still access to our God. We can come to him. We can present our requests to him. We are not abandoned. And incredibly, then also, we can pray that we would know those refreshing times once again. Steve has also already pictured for us refreshing, going into, into the fountain. But for me, there's nothing as refreshing as a glass of cold water poured on a hot day, a bit of football, half time. You need it, don't you? It's, there's something that gets to deep down. We're refreshed. That is what's promised here. As Christians, there is a promised blessing that is offered to us. And so we shouldn't just be settling in our Christian lives for some kind of day-to-day drudgery. That isn't what we see here. We see that we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us to refresh us. There are times, I'm sure, in all of our lives, our Christian lives, when we can remember vividly just how real, how precious the Lord Jesus Christ was and is for us. Times when we've known that peace that can only come from the spirits, the spirits reminding us that we are no longer condemned. But then also, there are times when we don't feel that. And I think here's a challenge for us. In those times, let's not give up, but let's seek after the Lord's refreshing. When was the last time you prayed, Lord, refresh me today? Lord, refresh me. Make yourself known to me. Make yourself known to me as I read your word. Make it real and clear. Make yourself known to me as I spend time with you now. 
May this time that I have, five minutes, 20 minutes, however long we have with the Lord, may it be like that cold, refreshing glass of water that reaches down and refreshes our soul as we know that we come before a God who loves us, a God who will never leave us, who will never forsake us. Let's pray that that would be our reality because God can and does provide that for us too. There is refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Finally then, and here's the the third blessing from the end of verse 20. Repent and turn back, Peter says, that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. This is the blessing that all Christians can enjoy. A glorious future hope. A hope that one day God will send the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, appointed for you. Isn't that incredible? Listen to those words. One day Jesus will return, and if you have repented and turned back, when Jesus returns, he will return for you. For you. What a hope this is that we have as Christians. This is a hope in itself that gives us refreshment, isn't it? Even in the darkest of days. But it also just gives us strength to keep on going. Even when we wouldn't say we're enjoying particular times of spiritual refreshing, if you are trusting in Jesus this evening, this future hope can never be taken from you. It can never change. Jesus will return for you. And that should change our perspective. As I've been thinking about this, I think there's nothing quite like a holiday to change a perspective in a calendar. But you see, there's still these days here, aren't there, before it. But those days, well, they're lived differently, aren't they? When we remember that what's coming. We remember what's coming. And this is so much greater than a holiday. So much greater than a time spent on the beach or whatever it might be. This is a time when we will know the presence of the Lord fully, forever. This is the hope that I think everyone in our world is longing for. This is the hope that Peter is proclaiming to those that he's speaking to. He's saying that there is something so much greater than the passing blessings of this world. There are many of them, aren't they? But they're gone tomorrow. They're snatched away from us. But this is our hope. This is our blessing that will never be taken from us. We have a future hope, a hope that stands the test of time, a hope that lasts beyond death and will last for eternity to come. We're going to sing these words in a moment, and they really sum up this hope. What reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. This is what God, through Peter, through his word, wants each and every one of us to know this evening and to remember as we go on into our weeks. If you are trusting in Jesus, you are blessed. You are greatly blessed because Jesus came to bless you too. So take these blessings with you. Picture them. Take them with you as you go on on to this week. Blessings of forgiveness. Your sin blotted out. Blessings of refreshment and a deep peace that can never be taken from us. And blessings of a future hope. Take those with you into your week. This is the goodness of our God that we can rejoice in. And if you're not a Christian here this evening, as we finish, know that these same blessings are on offer for you too. You can read yourself into this passage. Jesus came to bless you too if you will turn to him and repent. And at that point, hashtag blessed is not even going to touch what you're going to receive from our God. You will receive blessings now and blessings for eternity to come as your life will be completely transformed. Let's pray as we close.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that despite our desperate situation, you made a way. You sent your Son, the promised Messiah, to come and die for us, even though we were the ones who would put him to death. Lord, thank you so much that that is not the end of the story, that you have not left us in our sin, but that you have called to us. Even today you are calling to us, repent and turn back, because there is hope, because there is forgiveness if we will turn back and come to Christ. Lord, thank you for the death of Christ that has paid for every sin. And Lord, thank you that death could not contain him, and that as he rose... That gives us a great hope, a great hope that we will one day rise to, to be with our Lord forever. And Lord, as we now go on into this week, we thank you for that blessing likewise of present refreshing by the Spirit. Lord, please would you make that real to us this week as we spend time in your word, as we come before you in prayer, as we meet with other believers. Lord, please refresh our spirits. Show us that what we have in you is so much greater than anything else that the world would offer. We thank you so much for your goodness and your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to finish by standing and singing this great hope that we have because of Jesus. So let's stand and sing, Christ, our hope in life and death.
our God has always been a God of blessing. In the Old Testament, he gave, us, he gave the priest this blessing, and let's finish with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks.